Good day, dear friends, and we switch directly to the classroom of Lomonosov Moscow State University for a lecture by Anvar Ismailov, Doctor of Biology. The topic is on myrene bioluminescence. Dear colleagues, I'm going to do a lecture, a small lecture about bioluminescence. This phenomenon is so exotic, so unusual, so attractive. I would like to share with you all the knowledge that I have, the information that we have. I have been working on this topic for the last 40 years and during this period there are so many facts and so much knowledge that we accumulated uh, in Russia and in the world about bioluminescence, especially uh, at sea. One more reason. Not only it's a unique natural phenomenon, bioluminescent organisms are a target for many areas of research in medicine, biotechnologies, environment protection and ecology. Unfortunately, in past 30 years, scientific schools that existed in our country lost their relevance for a number of reasons, a little bit. First, I would like to say that in Russia bioluminescence as a phenomenon was first studied in Krasnoyarsk city and it's thanks to these people from the team from the Krasnoyarsk Biophysics Institute substantial progress was made in many directions of studies. Before we start talking about the bioluminescence in nature, I would like to clarify some definitions. People often use terms as jargonisms without understanding their meaning. Actually, bioluminescence is a narrow section, a small part of science about luminescence in general, i.e. the emission of light by substances or molecules. And there are a lot of uh, multiple luminescent reactions. Unfortunately, at least for me. Very often terms like fluorescence, bioluminescence are totally mixed up. This is why now I have to explain it all to you in such a detail. In any case, we deal with the same physically formal process. be it chemical or biological. We deal with electrons of a molecule that pass from the main level to the excitation level. As a result, a certain amount of energy is absorbed, light temperature, electric field, and that provokes physical or chemical reactions. When electrons go back to the main level, the stored energy goes down in form of photons or light quantums. This is what we need to understand. When we talk about luminescence of any kind, we deal with the enzyme-catalyzed reaction that leads to the emission of light. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Uh, 
fluorescence, phosphorescence, thermoluminescence, and other types of light, they have nothing to do with biology when the reaction is catalyzed by enzymes. This is not the same thing. That's why I am asking, please, never mix up fluorescence with luminescence, phosphorescence with bioluminescence. Please, it is important for us to speak the same language. So, to describe luminescence as a process, we had to use special equipment. It might seem unevident, but the studies of the luminescence only started when the technologies needed were developed enough. In that time, nuclear physics was developing quite actively, so the scientists had to register emissions resulting from chemical reactions. In the 50s and 60s, technologies allowing to register luminescence, including bioluminescence, were booming. Biologists must be really thankful to physicists who created a unique equipment unit which is called photomultiplier. When the light is emitted, you see the basic technology here. To this uh, photocathode, to this photomultiplier, electromagnetic fields of 1 or 2 kilowatt is applied. Electrons push others out, they accelerate in the electric field, producing electric current, which is then registered. You see, this simple equipment, before they were one meter high, but then they got smaller. Today's technologies allow us to use registering equipment of a size of a matchbox, etc. Thanks to the ability to easily and sensibly register light quantums up to single quantums coming from the test tubes and, and so on, we made a huge progress in the studies of the bioluminescence. In the same way that chemists made progress with chemiluminescence, physicists with thermoluminescence and so on. Thanks to the physical discoveries, we were able to understand this unique natural phenomenon, the light emitted by biological objects, inside of which enzyme provoked this special reaction. The history of bioluminescence is completely unique. Back since Aristotle, People have been describing glow in the seas and oceans. People turned to mystical explanations of what they were seeing. Different myths and legends appeared about how mystical glowing fields appear in the seas. Glowing breaking waves were observed. It was possible to observe milky stripes on the water surface, some milky layers with navigating ships, silver clouds with objects moving above the water surface. So it's natural that it created many legends, sometimes frightening ones. People noticed living objects floating in the seas. They were glowing. So means that they were glowing, they were emitting light. These monsters of different forms and shapes emitted light. 
and of course it frightened fishermen and sailors, creating legends. This is an incredible footage of a glowing breaking wave with really bright lights. The same light is observed during tsunamis when the glowing silver ridge of a huge wave is moving towards the city. It's bright, it's glowing, so it's clear that people were scared. Up until the middle of the 19th century, nobody knew that this glow can be produced by living organisms. Big glowing objects floating in the sea, it was one thing. People could not understand that. A hor another horrifying show was to see corpses of sea animals that were glowing during the night. Even more horrifying was to see a dead person's body, a human body that were glowing. Nobody understood anything. Then, finally, in the middle of the 19th century, people thought that maybe this glow is related to a living object. The term, then, was coined biological glow. Well, the term bioluminescence was not yet there. It appeared rather late. In the, fifth, in the middle of the 50s and 60s, before it was called luminescence, luciferase reaction, phosphor phosphorescence, etc., even though those phenomena are completely unrelated. By now, science has accumulated a lot of facts that we know about, but we cannot explain. This is the luminescence of multiple organisms in the seas and oceans. To separate them from the terrainous ones, let's remember them. Here you see luminescent bugs, insects, different mollusks, worms. Those are biological objects that emit light and live on land. You know that if you take a walk in the southern part of Russia, in Crimea, for example, you will see glowworms. In their bodies, they have special glowing organs, luminescent organs. We will look at the, uh, that later. We will think about the reasons. But the fact that you see these bugs, the uh, bugs that fly, that have luminescent parts of their bodies, that we say that they attract mates, we will talk about this. It is a well-known fact. We also have glowing worms. The next slide is dedicated to fungi. Here they are. It can seem like there are plenty of organisms that match on the earth and glow. But the truth is that there are single species, about 10 glow, uh, species of glowworms, a couple of dozens of fungi, some worms. There are not so many species. Believe me, this is a really small number compared to the number of species that are not luminescent. We won't talk about the reasons of the fungi luminescence, for example. But the fact is there. The fact of this luminescence is there. You can see it even here in Moscow. 
Unfortunately, the glowing insects on land are not as interesting because the vast majority of all the glowing species Eighty or ninety percent live in the sea, so they are the majority of them are marine luminescent organisms. It is considered that a number of luminescent organisms came out of the sea, adapted to the new conditions, and those glowing parts luminescent parts of their bodies stayed. The purpose of this uh, luminescence is uh, not yet the topic. Let's go to the marine or uh, marine organisms. Oh, this incredible world of marine organisms. In the seas and oceans, you have a, num a great number of diverse glowing objects that can have different dimensions, size and shapes. But at the same time, they don't have much in common. Not the structure, not uh, other properties. I would like to, you to pay attention to the fact among, uh, to the fact that among protozoans or one-celled animals there are a, lo uh, a lot of them are luminescent ones. Among marine organisms near 700 species from 30 families are luminescent. Some of them have the whole body luminescent, some only certain parts of the body. Others have internal organs that are luminescent. That's why we cannot state that uh, these objects are uh, homogeneous. Look at these great luminescent medusas. Look at these great luminescent starfish that live in the seas and oceans. And they live a normal life, just like their non-luminescent counterparts. But, again, they emit light. We will talk about it later, and you will tell me, why do they glow? They are simple creatures. They live a normal life. They create offspring that is luminescent too. They develop. Well, let's move further. Look at these shrimps. Look at these worms. All these objects have uh, live in the seas and oceans and they are all luminescent with different duration, intensity and range. So, I repeat, there is no uh, homogeneity neither in body structure, nor in light characteristics. A big part of all these organisms are fish. Look at them, just look at them. What do they have? They have special luminescent organs that are so-called photophores. Well, speaking frankly, it's the same thing, but sometimes they are separated because photophores are situated outside of the fish's body. 
Well, it's the same thing, never mind. Here you have more footage of fish that emit light. We will say uh, the light can be emitted by the photophores under the eye or it can be situated on the small rod. You see these rods in the pictures. Just take a look. Do you see these rods? And the la lantern is on. This is incredible. When the fish is hungry, it turns the lantern on. That's some audacity. It turns on the lantern. All the prey is lured to the light. The fish catches it. The fish is happy. It turns off the light. It satisfied its animal instincts. And the light is gone. I emphasize that every species has photophores in a specific place. Until recently, it was not clear how they managed to fix them, these photophores. Its function stays unclear too. Even with the small amount of identification studies that was carried out, with targeted studies of concrete depths, points in the Pacific Ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Northern America, near Bermuda Islands, near the Sea of Japan, we have very little knowledge about the fish's habitat, who lives where, what photophores do they have and where, and how do they emit light. Finally, our favorite squids and other cephalopods. They emit lights too. The most researched one among them is Hawaiian bobtail squid. It lives in the deep sea. Its luminescence was studied by multiple stud uh, scientists. Studies in Hawaii, understandable. And of course, uh, these studies bothered uh, him a lot. I share with you this information so that you know that bioluminescent organisms are very, very diverse. And this is a very small part of what we uh, what we have. Some of them have combined lights. There is there are different types of light. What we need to accept as a fact is that all the luminescent objects in the seas they can be divided into two classes. First group are organisms who have their own luminescent systems. Other have symbiotic luminescent bacteria that live in their organs, photophores, or in other parts. So with the help of these bacteria, fish, squids, and a number of invertebrates can emit light. This is the idea. It is considered that once managed to adapt to a symbiosis with luminescent bacteria and others received genetic material from the first ones, they managed to use it to generate their own light, to learn how to generate it themselves. It is considered so far as a fact, 
but in fact too few objects were studied. This luminescent bacteria have never been studied in detail. Today it is considered that these bacteria are the basis of the luminescent organisms, that they are ancient objects that emit light. The color can be green, blue or yellowish light. So these bacteria managed during the evolution they managed to stay in a symbiotic relationship with fish, squids and other organisms. Now it is considered that the whole marine luminescence is based on this ancient bacteria that managed to transfer their genetic material to this object, if not to integrate into the object. So, we think, where do these objects glow and why? Why do they do that? An interesting fact. From bacteria to bigger organisms, so to speak, the light lies normally in the blue or green range. 90% of all luminescent organisms emit light of this range from uh, 400 to 550 nanometers. It is considered that this is a good range to pass the light to long distances. A number of organisms emit light on this small range. We must understand that it means that we need special equipment to detect this kind of light. Indeed, these technologies was invented and applied. We dived it with Bathys Cave. We needed it to register this special light in the depths of the oceans. Here you see the graph of light range for different species. What you need to understand is that it is still a visible range. Nobody knows why this light is like this. To detect it, to register it, scientists had to replicate mechanisms that other organisms have in their eyes to be able to detect this kind of light. We have already seen the whole diversity of luminescent objects in the seas and oceans. We divided all of them into two categories. Those who are in symbiosis with bacteria in the photophores or, and organisms that produce their own light, like medusas, worms, mollusks, etc. And just imagine, all of this was studied during the last 50 years I must say that the biggest progress was reached in a very short time, starting from the 50s or so and up until now. And to be sincere, now the applied as aspect is more popular, but decades ago the ecological one, the biochemical one, they seemed more relevant. All of these findings are based on studies that were conducted by Russian scientists in the Krasnoyarsk Biophysics Institute 
in the Krasnoyarsk Federal University. And on findings or from scientists from the US, from Harvard, University of Illinois, from Australia, Sweden and Japan. They took samples from the deep sea and studied them in detail. Of course, there were some problems. As the objects live in the deep sea with low pressure, it was hard to keep them intact. However, that problem was resolved, and now these objects are described in detail in terms of emission, in terms of morphology and physiology. Ten years ago, a single map of fall luminescent organisms was created, where all the organisms from bacteria to fungi were registered. I took the old map that was made 10 years ago. It is clear that here you see all the objects, they are distributed by different criteria, they form a tree that we use quite often during work in order to add another new organism to one of the families, for example, when it, a new organism is discovered. So we see in front of us all these organisms, they are diverse, but all of them they produce the same chemical or biochemical reaction. You need to understand this in order to understand the whole common system. There is an enzyme, luciferase, an organic molecule called luciferin and energy donors. As you probably understand, these terms don't come from nowhere. You can guess that there was a, mi a myth about a fallen angel, a certain fallen angel called Lucifer, who was cast down into hell and who decides who comes to heaven and who comes to hell. So to be able to see in the darkness and not to mix people up, he invented the glowing system. He is luminescent and he is called Lucifer. What a nice guy. That's how the terms were coined. That's why they are called Luciferin organica, enzyme luciferase, and the third component is energy donors. Those are three components. You can tell me, luciferase and luciferin can be different in any case. But the system is the same for every luminescent organism. It's only here to explain these three components. We need an enzyme for bioluminescence, we need the light producer luciferin, it's a substrate, and the energy donors. Oxygen is needed too. Luminescence is impossible without the oxygen. In the end of the 19th century, it was first discovered that oxygen is needed. When finally these bacteria were taken from the water, they were put into the test bulb and agitated in order to boost the oxygen diffusion. And it turned out that with oxygen the light is brighter, as soon as you stop the light stops too. Well, 
it is it is still there but not as bright as with the oxygen so this is what we postulate the luciferase enzyme what is it actually why do we need it to generate light The idea was that if some objects are luminescent, some of them are not. Let's imagine that the luminescent ones have a special enzyme. It means this enzyme must be a complex one and the same for all the organisms to be able to transform the chemical energy into light energy. This idea was considered to be true for many years for luciferin. Scientists could not obtain the glow, this glowing enzyme. It seemed so hard to find, so easy to lose, so fragile, so unique. That's why so many objects cannot lum uh, be luminescent, because they don't have such an enzyme. But in the end, it was all a lie. Now we know that both luciferin and luciferase, variants of them, are very diverse, and they are very different one from another. Here you can see the luciferin organic molecules that we need to produce light. Well, the, here you see, I see a small error here. Well, those are heterocycle substances with complicated structure. that have powerful electron clouds that after the reactions catalyzed by the luciferase go, uh, can go to the excited level. So luciferase enzyme. This enzyme can boost quantum efficiency dramatically. Here you see emitters they react on the enzyme and as a result on the luciferase enzyme light is generated. But the emitters are all different, meaning that enzymes must be different too. This enzyme for the study was taken from bacteria. You know why? Because they are so easy to work with. Alternatively, with mollusks or squids to obtain the enzyme, to keep it stable, you would need a lot of biological material. Here you see the luciferin. The, uh, it has a classical flavin mononucleotide. And here you see the luciferase. Oh my god, everybody got so upset. Every, uh, everybody used to think that it was a complex enzyme with unique structure, that it was so unique, so special, nothing of the sort. The luciferase turned out to be the same for all the objects studied. Absolutely primitive enzyme. Two interconnected polypeptide chains. No metals. Nothing. Nothing interesting. Luciferase in other objects look just the same. Moreover, if you take famous fetoprotein, which are used as markers to monitor biochemical processes, you know about the 
so-called GFP and similar proteins. Famous proteins from medusas that now serve as indicators or markers in many biochemical processes. You heard about them, maybe. Well, they have only one peptide chain. And, and this enzyme can transform the energy. I think there's something here that we don't yet understand. A biological structure with such an efficiency with such a quantum yield in liquid areas, with above zero temperature. There must be something more complicated for that. We just don't understand how the physical chemistry works here. We don't understand yet the whole process. That's why they invented the enzyme stories that have nothing special inside. You see, I'm showing this uh, to you, to show you that there is not something fishy here. Understand, uh, don't understand how one polypeptide based only on amino acids can produce light energy. All the schemes that are shown everywhere, they are very primitive. Luciferin uh, reacts with luciferase, gives quantums of light, and it's all based on a peroxy linkage that gives a molecule in excited state and in the end we have a very primitive model that doesn't give any information. It shows us the organic molecules, the oxygen, the enzyme, and, and photons. That's it. We must stop here. So these schemes that I am describing were associated with the energy transformation process. In bacteria, we have flavin mono, mononucleotide, a classical luciferin, produces quantum of light, This is another luciferin structure that gives products on excitement level producing quantums of light. Also you have cylinterazine, one of the main luciferins, luciferins in the nature. So for all these organic molecules, chemical reactions are described in a way, you know, this is how the light is generated, and that's it. Chemical re uh, energy is transformed into light, and this kind of description is accepted. But still, bacteria are still the base of the whole process. I sound so upset because still very few objects are studied in order to describe the reaction. Luciferin is described and identified in only seven species. This is very little. The studies in recent years from the Organic Chemistry Institute allowed us to describe luciferin in worms and in fungi. But you see, this is a very hard laboratory work. You need a lot of biological material to carry it out, to identify the luciferin, to synthesize it, compare them both, to see how it acts. That's why, for now, unfortunately, we cannot say much about luciferins in all the 700 species. We don't know about all the luciferases either. 
because it's so hard to obtain. Just imagine how many squids and worms and fungi we need to collect it in due form, in crystallic form, to describe it in detail. So now we can only speak about approximative assessment of luciferase and luciferins that participate in this process. For, and we only talk about uh, a number of species. The number of objects is limited. Our favorite bacteria grow perfectly in bulbs. And it turned out that that's why they are the most studied cases. Both symbiotic and so-called free bacteria, there are free, few of them actually. We work with five or six types of bacteria. Although now they can be artificially generated in the labs and then they can receive the luciferase and be able to glow. But the wild types of bacteria that scientists are working with, you can see them on the slide. There are only five or six of them. Here is some of them are plankton type. They are heterotrophic organisms. They eat organic. They must live on organic organisms. Well, they, it's logical that they live in a place where they can find uh, food. And all these bacteria can be perfectly cultivated in the labs. And they emit photons. The power of this light is so big, so big that they are used as main objects in studies of energy transformation. Well, you're gonna like this one. I wanted to bring you a bulb with glowing bacteria, but unfortunately, my assistants could not do it. That's why I cannot show you the bulbs, but that's how, with the footage, I'm showing this uh, bacteria to you. Luminescent bulbs, uh, luminescent bacteria in bulbs. Let's go back to dead bodies glowing and big objects in the sea that are luminescent. The rest of the dead sea animals, all of it, it's the bacteria that live on them, on their surface. They are luminescence, they are heterotrophs, they eat the objects and then produce light. Do you understand? This must be so fun to observe. You go by the beach and suddenly you see a glowing corpse, you are sad and you think, why? Why is it luminescent? It's bacteria. If you catch a fish and leave it in a cool place for a couple of days, bacteria on its surface will come out and start being luminescent. First, it was considered that bacteria, luminescent bacteria are hard to catch, hard to cultivate, etc. Nothing like that. It turned out they are everywhere. You touch them, you drink them when you swim in the ocean. They live on your body and nothing bad happens. This is an important object that is used for bioluminescence studies. What is its function of this bioluminescence? What does it happen? And how is it happening? I uh, told this to you in the beginning. You see uh, the orange indicators. 
correspond to the bacteria with longest wave of light found near the coast of Indonesia. The green color corresponds to the majority of the organisms and the last category range is up to 480 nanometers. The reason is revealed. They have different lucif luciferins, different chemical structure. This bacteria as a main object of studies, they were studied from the point of view of geography. What is the map? Let's see, let's take a look. Here is the map. You see different types of bacteria. There are not a lot of types of them, but they are everywhere. They are dispersed on the earth in all the seas and oceans. This is a simple scheme to show you that factors like... Pay attention here that temperature, factors like temperature, depth, oxygen level determine the life of a species. There is also a species dispersion of the bacteria not only in latitudes, but in depths too. Here, take a look here. Single experiments were carried out in the Atlantic Ocean and in the Pacific Oceans. And these ex experiments revealed that the deeper we go, the less multiple are the bacteria. So their dispersion is related to the depth level. Depending on the net on the temperature, the regional differences are clear. In the end, in this table we see In the end, in this table, we see types of luminescent, symbiotic and non-symbiotic bacteria. In the upper part, you see the marine types of bacteria. The classification is not perfect and it's not complete yet. We show it to you because it's a classical table. We use it all the time. Gene systematization changed the situation, so the table needs a little update, maybe. They are all very nice and, and uh, luminescent, covering big objects and dead bodies. Well, this one may be not as nice, because it produces toxins that can give you cholera. But it is luminescent, after all. And on the bottom, you see freshwater bacteria that are, in fact, parasites of soul nematodes. They were found recently and they are not well researched yet. Anyway, these marine bacteria They don't only are luminescent themselves, but make luminescent squids, sponges and other organisms. They make them glow, so to speak. I still think that there is a lot to say on the subject. Here you see uh, saprophytes. What are saprophytes? These are bacteria that can possibly live on the surface, on the rest of the bodies. This is where the whole terrifying glow comes from. Not the corpses of dead whales or fish themselves are luminescent, but the bacteria covering them. This is the secret of 
all the myths and legends. Is it clear? This is a very important moment, mm, important point. Big progress that made the study of the marine bioluminescence is that uh, the genetic map was revealed. After this discovery, the lumin uh, after the discovery of luminescence system and describing the bacteria, after cloning this system and integrating them to other objects, from bacteria to bigger objects, we received the possibility to to make objects luminescent. Why do that? We need this genetic map. Yes, we need to discover A and B genes to see the substrate. But it's all done in order to better understand the glowing bacteria. When we when we started cloning those genes into other objects. Why? Because we are nauseously lazy. We don't want to analyze the enzyme that produces light. To make hard lab work with possibility of errors and calculations. Compare this to registering the light work especially when it's done with special equipment that registers the intensity of light. So you observe the light emission, and that's it. By cloning the glowing genes, you sue it to other relevant genes. And that way, they can serve as markers to monitor these other genes' activity. That's how you can monitor it, thanks to the light emission. This, this is what the development uh, of this science was. I'm trying to give you the whole picture, sometimes going into the details, so that you understand the complexity of the issue. An important progress was done in molecular physics and gene engineering. We can use the glowing genes, the luminescent genes, from the bacteria to make them serve as markers and making objects luminescent in the end. Five years ago, it became possible to identify and clone Medusa's genes. Osamu Shimomura received a Nobel Prize for this discovery, for discovering the luminescent genes and sewing technique that allowed to clone them into other objects. Many thanks to Dr. Ismailov for the lecture, because it was a rich topic to cover, and we have just a few minutes before the next lecture starts.